Act 4 of Love for Love by William Congreve Act 4, Scene 1 Valentine's Lodging Scandal and Jeremy Well, is your master ready? Does he look madly and talk madly? Yes, sir. You need make no great doubt of that. He that was so near turning poet yesterday morning can't be much to seek in playing the madman today. Would he have Angelica acquainted with the reasons for his design? No, sir, not yet. He has a mind to try whether his playing the madman won't make her play the fool and fall in love with him. Or at least to own that she has loved him all this while and concealed it. I saw her take coach just now with her maid, and to think I heard her bid the coachman drive hither. Like enough, sir, for I told her maid this morning my master was run stark mad only for love of her mistress. I hear a coach stop. If it should be she, sir, I believe he would not see her till he hears how she takes it. Well, I'll try her. Tis she. Here she comes. Scene two. To them, Angelica with Jenny. Mr. Scandal, I suppose you don't think it a novelty to see a woman visit a man at his own lodgings in a morning? Not upon a kind occasion, madam, but when a lady comes tyrannically to insult a ruined lover and make manifest the cruel triumphs of her beauty, the barbarity of it, something surprises me. I don't like raillery from a serious face. Pray, tell me, what is the matter? No strange matter, ma'am. My master's mad, that's all. I suppose your ladyship has thought him so a great while. How do you mean, mad? Why, faith, ma'am, he's mad for want of his wits, just as he was poor for want of money. His head is e'en as light as his pockets, and anybody that has a mind to a bad bargain can't do better than to beg him for his estate. If you speak truth, your endeavouring at wit is very unseasonable. Scandal aside. She's concerned and loves him. Mr. Scandal, you can't think me guilty of so much inhumanity as not to be concerned for a man I must own myself obliged to. Pray tell me truth. A faith, madam. I wish telling a lie would mend the matter, but this is no new effect of an unsuccessful passion. Angelica, aside. I know not what to think, yet I should be vexed to have a trick put upon me. May I not see him? I'm afraid the physician is not willing you should see him yet. Jeremy, go in and inquire. Scene 3. Scandal, Angelica, Jenny. Huh. I saw him wink and smile. I fancy this a trick. I'll try. I would disguise to all the world a failing which I must own to you. I fear my happiness depends upon the recovery of Valentine. Therefore I conjure you, as you are his friend, and as you have compassion upon one fearful of affliction, to tell me what I am to hope for. I cannot speak, but you may tell me, tell me, for you know what I would ask. So, this is pretty plain, but not too much concerned, madam. I hope his condition is not desperate. An acknowledgement of love from you, perhaps, may work a cure, as the fear of your aversion occasioned his distemp. Angelica, aside. Say you so. Nay, then I'm convinced. And if I don't play trick for trick, I may never taste the pleasure of revenge. Acknowledgement of love! I find you have mistaken my compassion and think me guilty of a weakness I am stranger to. But I have too much sincerity to deceive you and too much charity to suffer him to be deluded with vain hopes. Good nature and humanity oblige me to be concerned for him, but to love is neither in my power nor inclination. 
and if he can't be cured without I suck the poison from his wounds, I'm afraid he won't recover his senses till I lose mine. Hey, brave woman, I faith, won't you see him, then, if he desire it? What signify a madman's desires? Besides, t'would make me uneasy. If I don't see him, perhaps my concern for him may lessen. If I forget him, tis no more than he has done by himself, and now the surprise is over, methinks I am not half so sorry as I was. So, Faith, good nature works apace. You were confessing just now an obligation to his love. But I have considered that passions are unreasonable and involuntary. If he loves, he can't help it. And if I don't love, I can't help it. No more than he can help his being a man, or I my being a woman. Or no more than I can help my want of inclination to stay longer here. Come, Jenny. Scene 4. Scandal, Jeremy. Huh. An admirable composition, Faith. This same woman kind. What? Is she gone, sir? Gone? Why, she was never here, nor anywhere else. Nor I don't know her if I see her. Nor you neither. Good lack. What's the matter now? Are any more of us to be mad? Why, sir, my master longs to see her, and is almost mad in good earnest with the joyful news of her being here. We are all under a mistake. Ask no questions, for I can't resolve you, but I'll inform your master. In the meantime, if our project succeeded no better with his father than it does with his mistress, he may descend from his exaltation of madness into the road of common sense and be content only to be made a fool with other reasonable people. I hear, Sir Samson. You know your cue. I'll to your master. Scene 5. Jeremy, Sir Samson Legend, with a lawyer. Do you see, Mr. Buckram? Here's the paper signed with his own hand. Good, sir. And the conveyance is ready drawn in this box, if he be ready to sign and seal. Ready, body o' me, he must be ready. His sham sickness shan't excuse him. Oh, here's his scoundrel. Sirrah, where's your master? Ah, sir, he's quite gone. Gone? What? He is not dead? No, sir, not dead. What? Is he gone out of town? Run away? Ha! Has he tricked me? Speak, varlet. No, no, sir. He's safe enough, sir, and he were but as sound, poor gentleman. He is indeed here, sir, and not here, sir. Payday, rascal, do you banter me? Sirrah, do you banter me? Speak, sirrah, where is he? For I will find him. Would you could, sir, for he has lost himself. Indeed, sir, I have almost broke my heart about him. I can't refrain from tears when I think of him, sir. I'm as melancholy for him as a passing bell, sir, or a horse in a pound. A pox confound your similitude, sir. Speak to be understood, and tell me in plain terms what the matter is with him, or I'll crack your full skull. Ah, there you is it, sir. That's the matter with him, sir. His skull's cracked, poor gentleman. He's stark mad, sir. Mad? What? Is he non compos? Quite non compos, sir. Why, then, all's obliterated, Sir Samson, if he be non compos mentis. His act and deed will be of no effect. It is not good in law. Oons, I wouldn't believe it. Let me see him, sir. Mad? I'll make him find his senses. Mr. Scandal is with him, sir. I'll knock at the door. Goes to the scene, which opens. Scene 6. Sir Samson, Valentine, Scandal, Jeremy and Lawyer. Valentine upon a couch, disorderly dressed. How now? What's here to do? Valentine, starting. Huh? Who's that? For heaven's sake, softly, sir, and gently, don't provoke him. Answer me, who is that and that? Gets Bobs, does he not know me? 
Is he mischievous? I'll speak gently. Val, Val, dost thou not know me, boy? Not know thy own father, Val? I am thy own father, and this is honest, brief Buckram, the lawyer. It may be so. I did not know you. The world is full. There are people that we do know, and people that we do not know, and yet the sun shines upon all alike. There are fathers that have many children, and there are children that have many fathers. Tis strange, but I am truth, and come to give the world the lie. Body of me, I know not what to say to him. Why does that lawyer wear black? Does he carry his conscience without side? Uh, lawyer, what art thou? Dost thou know me? Oh, Lord, what must I say? Yes, sir. Thou liest, for I am truth. Tis hard I cannot get a livelihood amongst you. I have been sworn out of Westminster Hall the first day of every term, let me see, no matter how long, but I'll tell you one thing. It's a question that would puzzle an arithmetician. If you should ask him whether the Bible saves more souls in Westminster Abbey or damns more in Westminster Hall, <laughs> for my part... I am truth and can't tell. I have a very few acquaintance. But on me, he talks sensibly in his madness. Has he no intervals? Very short, sir. Sir, I can do you no service while he's in this condition. Here's your paper, sir. He may do me a mischief if I stay. The conveyance is ready, sir, if he recover his senses. Scene 7. Sir Sampson, Valentine, Scandal, Jeremy. Hold, hold, don't you go yet. You'd better let him go, sir, and send for him if there be occasion, for I fancy his presence provokes him more. Is the lawyer gone? Oh, tis well. Then we may drink about without going together by the ears. Hi-ho! What o'clock is it? Uh, my father here? Oh, your blessing, sir. He recovers. Bless thee, Val. How dost thou do, boy? Thank you, sir. Pretty well. I've been a little out of order. Won't you please to sit, sir? Aye, boy. Come, thou shalt sit down by me. Sir, tis my duty to wait. No, no, come, come, sit thee down, honest Val. How dost thou do? Let me feel thy pulse. Oh, pretty well now, Val. Body of me, I was sorry to see thee indisposed. But I'm glad thou art better, honest Val. I thank you, sir. Scandal aside. Miracle! The monster grows loving! Let me feel thy hand again, Val. It does not shake. I believe thou canst write, Val. Ha, boy, thou canst write thy name, Val. In whisper to Jeremy. Jeremy, step and overtake Mr. Buckram. Bid him make haste back with the conveyance. Quick, quick. Scene 8. Sir Sampson, Valentine, Scandal. Scandal aside. That ever I should suspect such a heathen of any remorse. Dost thou know this paper, Val? I know that honest and wilt perform articles. Shows him the paper, but holds it out of his reach. Pray let me see it, sir. You hold it so far off that I can't tell whether I know it or no. See it, boy? Aye, aye, why? Thou dost see it. Tis thy own hand, Valley. Why, let me see. I can read it as plain as can be. Look you here. Reads. The condition of this obligation. Look you, as plain as can be, so it begins. And then at the bottom, as witness my hand, Valentine legend in great letters. Why, tis as plain as the nose in one's face. What, are my eyes better than thine? I believe I can read it farther off. Let me see. Stretches his arm as far as he can. Will you please to let me hold it, sir? Let thee hold it, sayest thou? Aye, with all my heart. What matter is it who holds it? 
What need anybody hold it? I'll put it up in my pocket, Val, and then nobody need hold it. Puts the paper in his pocket. There, Val, it's safe enough, boy, but thou shalt have it as soon as thou hast set thy hand upon another paper, little Val. Scene 9. To them, Jeremy with Buckram. What? Is my bad genius here again? Oh, no, tis the lawyer with an itching palm, and he comes to be scratched. My nails are not long enough. Let me have a pair of red-hot tongs quickly, quickly, and you shall see me act St. Dunstan and lead the devil by the nose. Oh, Lord, let me be gone. I'll not venture myself with a madman. Scene 10. Sir Sampson, Valentine, Scandal, Jeremy. Ha ha ha! You need not run so fast. Honesty will not overtake you. Ha ha ha! The rogue found me out to be in the form of pauperis presently. Oons, what a vexation is here. I know not what to do or say, nor which way to go. Who's that that's out of his way? I am truth and can set him right. Harky, friend, the straight road is the worst way you can go. He that follows his nose always will very often be led into a stink. Probatum est. But what are you for, religion or politics? There's a couple of topics for you, no more like one another than oil and vinegar, and yet, those two, beaten together by a state cook, make sauce for the whole nation. What the devil had I to do ever to beget sons? Why did I ever marry? Because thou wert a monster, old boy. The two greatest monsters in the world are a man and a woman. What's thy opinion? Why, my opinion is that those two monsters joined together make yet a greater. That's a man and his wife. Ah, old true penny, sayest thou so? Thou hast nicked it, but it's wonderful strange, Jeremy. What is, sir? That grey hairs should cover a green head, and I make a fool of my father. What's here, Era Potter? or a bearded sibyl. If prophecy comes, truth must give place. Scene 11. Sir Sampson, Scandal, Foresight, Miss Foresight, Mrs. Frail. What says he? What did he prophesy? Oh, Sir Sampson, bless us. How are we? Are we? A pox o' your prognostication. Why, we are fools as we used to be. Oons, that you could not foresee that the moon would predominate. My son be mad! Where's your oppositions, your trines and your quadrates? What did your Cardan and your Ptolemy tell you? Your Mishala and your Longa Montanus, your harmony of chiromancy and astrology. Ah, poxant! That I that know the world and men and manners, that don't believe a syllable in the sky and stars and sun and almanacs and trash, should be directed by a dreamer an omen hunter, and defer business and expectation of a lucky hour, when, body o' me, there never was a lucky hour after the first opportunity. Scene 12. Scandal, Foresight, Mrs. Foresight, Mrs. Frail. Sir Samson, heaven help your head. This is none of your lucky hour. Nemo omnibus oris sapit. What? Is he gone, and in contempt of science? Ill stars and unconvertible ignorance attend him. You must excuse his passion, Mr. Forsyth, for he has been heartily vexed. His son is non compass mentis, and therefore incapable of making any conveyance in law, so that all his measures are disappointed. Ah, say you so? Mrs. Frail, aside to Mrs. Forsyth. What? Has my sea-lover lost his anchor of hope, then? Oh, sister, what will you do with him? Do with him? Send him to sea again in the next foul weather. 
He's used to an inconstant element and won't be surprised to see the tide turned. Foresight considers. Wherein was I mistaken not to foresee this? Scandal aside to Mrs. Foresight. Madam, you and I can tell him something else that he does not foresee, and more particularly relating to his own fortune. What do you mean? I don't understand you. Hush, softly. The pleasures of last night, my dear. Too considerable to be forgot so soon. Last night? And what would your impudence infer from last night? Last night was like the night before, I think. So, Death, do you make no difference between me and your husband? Not much. He's superstitious, and you are mad, in my opinion. You make me mad. You are not serious. Pray recollect yourself. Oh, yes. Now I remember. You were very impertinent and impudent, and would have come to bed to me. And did not? Did not. With that face, can you ask the question? This I have heard before, but never believed. I have been told that she had that admirable quality of forgetting to a man's face in the morning, that she had lain with him all night, and denying that she had done favours with more impudence than she could grant him. Madam, I am your humble servant, and honour you. You look pretty well, Mr. Farsight. How did you rest last night? Truly, Mr. Scandal. I was so taken up with broken dreams and distracted visions that I remember little. It was a very forgetting night. But what, you not talk with Valentine? Perhaps you may understand him. I'm apt to believe there is something mysterious in his discourses and sometimes rather think him inspired than mad. You speak with singular good judgment, Mr. Scandal, truly. I am inclining to your Turkish opinion in this matter, and do reverence a man whom the vulgar think mad. Let us go to him. Sister, do you stay with them. I'll find out my lover, and give him his discharge and come to you. Oh, my conscience! Here he comes! Scene 13, Mrs. Frail, Ben. All mad, I think. Flesh, I believe all the calentures of the sea are come ashore for my part. Mr. Benjamin, in collar? No, I'm pleased well enough now I have found you. Yes, I've had such a hurricane upon your account yonder. My account? Pray, what's the matter? Why, father came and found me squabbling with yon shitty faced singers he would have me marry, so he asked what was the matter. They asked in a surly sort of a way. It seems brother Val has gone mad, and so that put him into a passion. But what did I know that? What's that to me? So I asked in a surly sort of manner, and again I answered in a surlily. What love he be my father, I ain't bound prentice to him. So, faith, I told him plain terms, if I were minded to marry, I'd marry to please myself, not him. And for a young woman that he provided for me, I thought it more fitting for her to learn her sampler and make dirt pies than to look after her husband. For my part, I was none of her man. I had another voyage to make. Let him take it as he will. So, then, you intend to go to sea again? Nay, nay, my mind run upon you, but I will not tell him so much. So he said he'd make my heart ache, and if so be that he could get a woman to his mind, he'd marry himself. Cad, says I, and you play the fool and marry at these years, there's more danger of your head's aching than my heart. He was woundy angry when I had given that wife. He hadn't a word to say, and so I left him and the green girl together. Mayhap the bee may bite, and he'll marry her himself with all my heart. And were you this undutiful and graceless wretch to your father? Then why was he graceless first? If I am undutiful and graceless, why did he beget me so? I did not get myself. Oh, impiety! How have I been mistaken? What an inhuman, merciless creature have I set my heart upon! 
Oh, I am happy to have discovered the shelves and quicksands that lurk beneath that faithless, smiling face. Hey, Toss, what's the matter now? Why, you've been angry, be you? Oh, see me no more, for thou wert born amongst rocks, suckled by whales, cradled in a tempest, and whistled to by winds. And thou art come forth with fins and scales and three rows of teeth, a most outrageous fish of prey. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, she's mad, poor young woman. Love has turned her senses, her brain is quite overset. Well, a day, how shall I do to set her to rights? No, no, I am not mad, monster. I am wise enough to find you out. Hadst thou the impudence to aspire at being a husband with that stubborn and disobedient temper? You that know not how to submit to a father, presume to have a sufficient stock of duty to undergo a wife? I should have been finely fobbed indeed, very finely fobbed. Harky forsooth! If so be that you are in your right senses, you see, for hot as I perceive, I'm like to be finely fobbed. If I've got anger here upon your account, and you are tacked about already. What do you mean at all your fair speeches and striking my cheeks and kissing and hugging? What would you shear off so? Would you, and leave me aground? No, I'll leave you adrift, and go which way you will. What? Are you false-hearted, then? Only the winds changed. More shame for you. The winds changed? It's an ill wind blows nobody good. Mayhap I have a good riddance on you, if these be your tricks. What? Does you mean all this while to make a fool of me? Any fool but a husband. Husband? Cat, I would not be your husband if you would have me now. I know your mind. So have you had your weight in gold and jewels, and if I loved you never so well? Why, canst thou love, porpoise? No matter what I can do, don't call me names. I don't love you so well as to bear that whatever I did. I'm glad you show yourself, mistress. Let the merry ears don't know you. Gad, I know you too well, by sad experience. I believe he that marries you will go to sea in a hen-picked frigate. I believe that, young woman. And that may come to an anchor at Cuckle's Point. Oh, there's a dash for you. Take it as you will. Mayhap you may haul after me when I won't come to. Ha <laughs> ha No doubt on it. My true love's gone to sea. My true love's gone to sea. My true love's gone. Scene 14. Mrs. Frail, Mrs. Forsyth. Oh, sister, had you come a minute sooner, you would have seen the resolution of a lover. Honest Tar and I are parted and with the same indifference that we met. Oh, my life, I am half vexed at the insensibility of a brute that I despised. What then? He bore it most heroically? Most tyrannically, for you see he has got the start of me, and I, the poor forsaken maid, am left complaining on the shore. But I'll tell you a hint that he has given me. Sir Samson is enraged and talks desperately of committing matrimony himself. If he has a mind to throw himself away, he can't do it any more effectually than upon me, if we could bring it about. Oh, hang him, old fox. He's too cunning. Besides, he hates both you and me. But I have a project in my head for you, and I have gone a good way towards it. I have almost made a bargain with Jeremy, Valentine's man, to sell his master to us. Sell him? How? Valentine raves upon Angelica and took me for her. And Jeremy says we'll take anybody for her that he imposes on him. Now, I have promised him mountains. If in one of his mad fits, he will bring you to him in her stead and get you married together and put to bed together. And after consummation, girl, there's no revoking. And if he should recover his senses, he'll be glad at least to make you a good settlement. 
Here they come. Stand aside a little and tell me how you like the design. Scene 15. Mrs. Forsythe, Mrs. Frail, Valentine, Scandal, Forsythe and Jeremy. Scandal to Jeremy. And have you given your master a hint of their plot upon him? Yes, sir. He says he'll favour it and mistake her for Angelica. It may make a sport. Mercy on us. Hushed, interrupt me not. I'll whisper prediction to thee, and thou shalt prophesy. I am truth, and can teach thy tongue a new trick. I have told thee what's past. Now I'll tell what's to come. Dost thou know what will happen tomorrow? Oh, answer me not, for I will tell thee. Tomorrow, knaves will thrive through craft, and fools through fortune, and honesty will go as it did, frost nipped in a summer suit. Ask me questions concerning tomorrow. Ask him, Mr. Forsythe. Pray, what will be done at court? Scandal will tell you. I am truth. I never come there. In the city? Oh, prayers will be said in empty churches at the usual hours. Yet you will see such zealous faces behind counters, as if religion were to be sold in every shop. Oh, things will go methodically in the city. The clocks will strike twelve at noon, and the horned herd buzz in the exchange at two. Wives and husbands will drive distinct trades, and care and pleasure separately occupy the family. Coffee houses will be full of smoke and stratagem and the cropped prentice that sweeps his master's shop in the morning may tend to one dirty his sheets before night. But there are two things that you will see very strange, which are wanton wives with their legs at liberty and tame cuckholes with chains around their necks. But hold, I must examine you before I go further. You look suspiciously. Are you a husband? I am married. Poor creature. Is your wife of Covent Garden Parish? No, St. Martin's in the fields. Alas, poor man. His eyes are sunk and his hands shriveled, his legs dwindled and his back bowed. Pray, pray for a metamorphosis. Change thy shape and shake off age. Get thee Medea's kettle and be boiled anew. Come forth with labyrinth callous hands, a chine of steel and atlas shoulders. Let Taliacosius trim the calves of twenty chairmen and make the pedestals to stand erect upon. And look matrimony in the face. Ha, ha, ha! That a man should have a stomach to a wedding supper when the pigeons ought rather to be laid to his feet. Ha, ha, ha! His frenzy is very high now, Mr. Scandal. I believe it is springtide? Oh, very likely, truly. You understand these matters. Uh, Mr. Scandal, I shall be very glad to confer with you about these things which he has uttered. His sayings are very mysterious and hieroglyphical. Oh, why would Angelica be absent from my eyes so long? She's here, sir. Now, sister. Oh, Lord, what must I say? Humor him, madam. By all means. Where is she? Oh, 
I see her, she comes, <laughs> like riches, health, and liberty, at once to a despairing, starving, and abandoned wretch. Oh, welcome, welcome. How do you, sir? Can I serve you? Harky, I have a secret to tell you. Endymion and the moon shall meet us upon Mount Latmos, and we'll be married in the dead of night. But say not a word. Hymen shall put his torch into a dark lanthorn, that it may be secret. And Juno shall give her peacock puppy water that we may fold his ogling tail, and Argus's hundred eyes be shut. Ah, nobody shall know but Jeremy. No, no, we'll keep it secret. It shall be done presently. The sooner the better. Jeremy, come hither, closer, that none may overhear us. Jeremy, I can tell you news. Angelica is turned nun. And I am turning friar, and yet we'll marry one another in spite of the Pope. Get me a cowl in beads, that I may play my part, and she'll meet me two hours hence in black and white, and a long veil to cover the project. And we won't see one another's faces till we have done something to be ashamed of. And then we'll blush once for all. Scene 16. To them, Tattle and Angelica. I'll take care and... Whisper. Nay, Mr. Tattle, if you make love to me, you spoil my design, for I intend to make you my confidant. But, madam, to throw away your person... Such a person, and such a fortune on a madman. I never loved him till he was mad, but don't tell anybody so. How's this? Tuttle making love to Angelica? Tell, madam? Alas, you don't know me. I have much ado to tell your ladyship how long I have been in love with your... But encouraged by the impossibility of Valentine's making any more addresses to you, I have ventured to declare the very inmost passion of my heart. Oh, madam, look upon us both. There you see the ruins of a poor decayed creature. Here a complete and lively figure with youth and health, and all his five senses in perfection, madam, and to all this the most passionate lover. Oh, fie for shame, hold your tongue. A passionate lover and five senses in perfection. When you are as mad as Valentine, I'll believe you love me. <laughs> and the maddest shall take me. It is enough. Ha! Huh? Who's here? Frail to Jeremy. Oh, Lord, her coming will spoil all. No, no, ma'am, he won't know her. If he should, I can persuade him. Scandal, who are these? Foreigners? If they are, I'll tell you what I think. Get away all the company but Angelica, that I may discover my design to her. I will. I have discovered something of Tuttle that is of a piece with Mrs. Fail. He calls Angelica. If we could contrive to couple them together, her key. He won't know you, cousin. He knows nobody. But he knows more than anybody. Oh, niece. He knows things past and to come, and all the profound secrets of time. Look you, Mr. Foresight, it is not my way to make many words of matters, and so I shan't say much. But in short, do you see I will hold you a hundred pounds now, that I know more secrets than he? How? 
I cannot read that knowledge in your face, Mr. Tattle. Pray, what do you know? Why do you think I tell you, sir? Read it in my face? No, sir, tis written in my heart, and safer there, sir, than letters writ in juice of lemon, for no fire can fetch it out. I am no blab, sir. Acquaint Jeremy with it. He may easily bring it about. Uh, they are welcome, and I'll tell him so myself. To scandal. What? Do you look strange upon me? Well, then I must be plain. Coming up to them. I am truth, and hate an old acquaintance with a new face. Scandal goes aside with Jeremy. Do you know me, Valentine? You? Who are you? <laughs> no, I hope not. I am Jack Tattle, your friend. My friend? What to do? I am no married man, and thou canst not lie with my wife. I am very poor, and thou canst not borrow money of me. Then what employment have I for a friend? Ha! Ah, a good open speaker, and not to be trusted with a secret. Do you know me, Valentine? Oh, very well. Who am I? You're a woman. One to whom heaven gave beauty when it grafted roses on a briar. You are the reflection of heaven in a pond, and he that leaps at you is sunk. You are all white, a sheet of lovely spotless paper when you first are born. But you are to be scrawled and blotted by every goose's quill. I know you. For I loved a woman, and loved her so long, that I found out a strange thing. I found out what a woman was good for. I prithee, what's that? Why, to keep a secret. Oh, Lord. Oh, exceedingly good to keep a secret. For though she should tell, yet... She is not to be believed. Ha! Good again, Faith. I would have music. Sing me the song that I like. Song. I tell thee, Charmion, could I time retrieve, and could again begin to love and live, to you I should my earliest offering give. I know my eyes would lead my heart to you, and I should all my vows and oaths renew. But to be plain, I never could be true. For by our weak and weary truth I find, love hates to center in a point assigned, but runs with joy the circle of the mind. Then never let us chain what should be free, but for relief by the sex agree, since women love to change, and so do we. No more, for I am melancholy. Walks musing. Jeremy to scandal. I'll do it, sir. Uh, Mr. Forsyth, we had best leave him. He may grow outrageous and do mischief. I will be directed by you. Jeremy to Mrs. Frail. You'll meet, ma'am. I'll take care everything shall be ready. Thou shalt do what thou wilt. I will deny thee nothing. Tuttle to Angelica. Madam, shall I wait upon you? No, I'll stay with him. Mr. Scandal will protect me. And Mr. Teddle desires you would give him leave to wait on you. Pox on it. There's no coming off now she has said that. Madam, will you do me the honor? Mr. Teddle might have useless ceremony. 
Scene 17. Angelica Valentine Scandal. Jeremy, follow Tattle. Mr. Scandal, I only stay till my maid comes, and because I had a mind to be rid of Mr. Tattle. Madam, I am very glad that I overheard a better reason which you gave to Mr. Tattle. For his impertinence forced you to acknowledge a kindness for Valentine, which you denied to all his sufferings and my solicitations. So, I'll leave him to make use of the discovery and your ladyship to the free confession of your inclinations. Oh heavens, you won't leave me alone with a madman. No, madam, I don't leave a madman to his remedy. Scene 18, Angelica. Valentine. Madam, you need not be very much afraid, for I fancy I begin to come to myself. Angelica, aside. Aye, but if I don't fit you, I'll be hanged. You see what disguises love makes us put on. Gods have been in counterfeited shapes for the same reason. And the divine part of me, my mind, has worn this mask of madness and this motley livery only as the slave of love and menial creature of your beauty. Mercy on me, how he talks! Poor Valentine! Nay, Faith, now let us understand one another, hypocrisy apart. The comedy draws toward an end and let us think of leaving acting and be ourselves. And since you have loved me, you must own I have at length deserved you should confess it. I would I had loved you, for heaven knows I pity you, and could I have foreseen the bad effects, I would have striven. But that's too late. <sighs> what sad effects? What's too late? My seeming madness has deceived my father and procured me time to think of means to reconcile me to him and preserve the right of my inheritance to his estate, which otherwise, by articles, I must this morning have resigned. And this I had informed you of today, but you were gone before I knew you had been here. How? I thought your love of me had caused this transport in your soul, which it seems you only counterfeited for mercenary ends and sordid interest. Nay, now you do me wrong, for if any interest was considered, it was yours, since I thought I wanted more than love to make me worthy of you. Then you thought me mercenary? But how am I deluded by this interval of sense to reason with a madman? Oh, tis barbarous to misunderstand me longer. Scene 19. To them, Jeremy. Oh, he is a reasonable creature. Sure, he will not have the impudence to persevere. Come, Jeremy, acknowledge your trick, and confess your master's madness counterfeit. Counterfeit, man. I'll maintain him to be as absolutely and substantially mad as any free order in Bethlehem. Nay, he's as mad as any projector, fanatic, chemist, lover, or poet in Europe. Sarah, you be, I am not mad. <laughs> you see, he denies it. Oh, Lord, ma'am, did you ever know any madman mad enough to own it? Sot, can't you apprehend? Why, he talked very sensibly just now. Yes, ma'am, he has intervals. But, you see, he begins to look wild again now. Why, you thick-skulled rascal, I tell you the farce is done, and I will be mad no longer. Beats him. <laughs> is he mad? Or no, Jeremy? Partly, I think, for he does not know his mind two hours. I'm sure I left him just now in the humour to be mad, and I think that I have not found him very quiet at this present. One knocks. Who's there? 
Go see, you sot. I'm very glad that I can move your mirth, though not your compassion. I did not think you had apprehension enough to be exceptions. But madmen show themselves most by over-pretending to a sound understanding, as drunken men do by over-acting sobriety. I was half inclining to believe you, till I accidentally touched upon your tender part. But now you have restored me to my former opinion and compassion. Sir, your father has sent to know if you are any better yet. Will you please to be mad, sir, or how? Stupidity! You know the penalty of all I'm worth must pay for the confession of my senses. I'm mad, and will be mad to everybody but this lady. So, just the very backside of truth. But lying is a figure in speech that interlards the greatest part of my conversation. Ma'am, your ladyship's woman. Scene 20. Valentine, Angelica, Jenny. Well, have you been there? Come hither. Jenny, aside to Angelica. Yes, madame. Sir Samson will wait upon you presently. You're not leaving me in this uncertainty? Would anything but a madman complain of uncertainty? Uncertainty and expectation are the joys of life. Security is an insipid thing, and the overtaking and possessing of a wish discovers the folly of the chase. Never let us know one another better, for the pleasure of a masquerade is done when we come to show our faces. But I'll tell you two things before I leave you. I am not the fool you take me for, and you are mad and don't know it. Scene 21. Valentine, Jeremy. From a riddle you can expect nothing but a riddle. There's my instruction in the moral of my lesson. What is the lady gone again, sir? I hope you understood one another before she went. Understood? She is harder to be understood than a piece of Egyptian antiquity or an Irish manuscript. You may pour till you spoil your eyes and not improve your knowledge. I have heard them say, sir, they read art Hebrew books backwards. Maybe you begin to read at the wrong end. They say so of a witch's prayer, and dreams and Dutch almanacs are to be understood by contraries. But there's regularity and method in that. She is a medal without a reverse or inscription, for indifference has both sides alike. Yet, while she does not seem to hate me, I will pursue her, and know her if it is possible in spite of the opinion of my satirical friend Scandal, who says that women are like tricks by sleight of hand, which to admire we should not understand. End of Act 4